In today's video, we're going to be rescuing an abandoned server. So this is going to be a fairly interesting video. Let me explain. So I'm a member of a local hackerspace, and one of the perks of membership there is that you can co-locate a server on site. So for the last many years, I think since 2016 or so, I've had a server out here. However, obviously the whole COVID pandemic hit a few years ago, and since then I've not been able to get out here or really do anything with the server. Compounding this, shortly after the pandemic hit, the IP addressing out here changed, and I'd never actually got around to updating the IP address on my server. So essentially for the last three and a half years, the server's been basically sitting here running, but I've not been able to access it, and it's kind of been offline. So today I've finally been able to make it back out, and we're going to try and find the server, see what sort of condition it's in, and see if we can bring it back to life as an off-site backup server for myself. So yeah, it'll be kind of interesting to see what it's like, because I have no idea what condition it's going to be in. It's been running out here for many years. It might be completely dead. I have no idea. Because basically this server's been sitting here offline, untouched for at least three and a half years, possibly longer. So yeah, time to go inside and see what condition it's in. And here we have the server. So as you can see, it's sitting there and it is still powered on. So it's not completely dead at least. And obviously it's completely cut off to the outside world. There's no working network connection on this really. But it is alive. So hopefully we can rescue this thing. Although, it is going to need a lot of cleaning. This is essentially in a storeroom, and it is absolutely filthy. Like you can see the amount of dust in here, all in all the drive bays. The top of it is absolutely caked in dust. I don't think what it'll be like inside, so yeah. It's going to need a big clean. So, I suppose the main thing to do is just turn this off, take out the rack, and start restoring it. But first of all, what I'll do is I'll plug a console into this, just to see what it's doing. Okay, so I've just plugged a monitor into it. And as you can see, it is up and running, so I've logged in. As you can see, the uptime is 427 days. That's obviously not the full three and a half years this machine's basically been abandoned for. There will have been power cuts in here. There's not a sort of, I don't know if there's a UPS or anything power that, powering this, so there will have been power cuts. So that's probably the last time since a power cut. But, yep, it's up and running now. Obviously, there's no working network connection, but it's running. Um, I've also done a little bit of testing. This is actually running Zen. Uh, for some reason, it's running Zen on FreeBSD. I, I previously thought that was a good idea. And the Zen virtual machines are still running on it, so... Yeah, it's actually working. Um, obviously, this is not what we're going to use long term. I'm going to completely wipe this and reinstall Proxmox. So, yeah, but we can see it's running. So let's just power this off and then we can take this out and rebuild it. There we go. So power off. Let's shut this machine down. And then clean it all up. Okay, so now move the server to a better location with better, better lighting. And yeah, as we can see, this thing is absolutely filthy. So it's going to need a lot of work to restore it. But yeah, so let's talk about the server. So the server itself is an HP DL120G7. It's one of the HP sort of entry-level Xeon E3 based servers. It's pretty old. I think it's from maybe 2012, 2013. I actually bought this way back around about then. I think I got it as like a sort of new in-box type thing. It was a pretty new server when I bought it. I had it co-located in a data center for a while on a sort of one new colo plan. Um, you can still see a remnant of that with this network, this sticker here that says connect bottom network port. Because when I shipped it to the Colo facility, that was like, right, this is the port that's configured, connect that. After that, I sort of ended up lending it to a separate organization for a while. They had it for many years, and eventually it ended up here. So it's not a bad little server. I mean, it is pretty old now. I mean, we're talking, you know, 10 years old or so. But for essentially an off-site backup host, it's absolutely fine. So, yeah, that's what we have there. So it's a... Xeon E3, we'll get it turned on later, I can't quite remember the model, I think it's a 1220, like whatever the most entry-level one is. We'll pop up and look at the RAM, I think it's 16 or 24 gigs, something like that. So, yeah, let's pop the server open and see what's inside. I've already taken out the screw, because for some reason I decided to leave the screw in, even though it's a sort of toolless top removal. So, let's get inside this and see what we have. I do need to apologize, I don't have a tripod right now, so I'm kind of just... So you're only going to see sort of handheld shots of me in between doing things. I can't really do things and hold the camera at the same time. But yeah, let's get the top off and see what sort of state this is in. Because if the top's anything to go by, it's not going to be very clean. Why did I do that? Now my hand's covered in dirt. Great. And I need to turn the camera off with a hand covered in filth. Great. So, yep, time to take, off, take the top off this and see what state it's in. So, uh, yeah, this is going to be fun to clean. As you can see, this thing is absolutely filthy inside. You see the amount of dirt on the fans there. Up there, I mean, that's not even inside the fans. I mean, inside the fans is probably going to be absolutely horrific. Down the back there, the hard drives are pretty dirty. You can just see on the top there where the fans have been. 
You see the amount of dirt left on the top. So yeah, what I'll do is I'll take this outside. I've got an air blower and I'll just try and clean this out as best I can. But before we do that, what we'll do is we'll quickly take a look at the parts we have inside. Obviously, we've got the CPU there, which I think is a Xeon E3 1220. But we'll see how much RAM we have and what hard drives we have currently. But we'll upgrade the RAM and put new hard drives in. So yeah, we'll take these parts out and see what we have. Okay, so I've dug into it a bit more. So you can see that we have the RAM over here. And it turns out we had a total of 20 gigs. So there's two 8 gig sticks and two, two 2 gig sticks. If I remember correctly, this machine came with 8 gigs of RAM, so that would have been four 2 gig sticks. And I think I must have taken two, two of those out and put two 8 gig sticks in to put it up to 20 gig. And this machine's a bit annoying. It's one of those ones that's unregistered ECC RAM that it needs, but I've got a couple of 8 gig sticks spare, so I think I'll put, it, I'll put those in along with those two 8 gig sticks to put it up to 32 gig. It's not really going to need that, but I may as well. Hard drive wise, we've then got a pair of Toshiba 2TB SATA drives. They're 1700 RPM, but they're just standard SATA drives. I'll be upgrading these with four 4TB four drives that we'll take a look at later just to get a bit more storage. But yeah, there's currently a pair of two 2TB two drives. And then over here, we can see the CPU heatsink. Just wanted to show this because now I've taken that shroud thing off, you can see the amount of dust clogging up that heatsink. That is a bit ridiculous. So yeah, it's going to be quite satisfying cleaning this. So I suppose the next thing to do take this outside and give it a good clean. I don't know if I'll be able to film that because it's outside and it's a bit dark at the moment so I probably want a very good lighting. So I'll put in a clip if I do, if I, if I can, but if not, next time you see this will be, this will be a lot cleaner. So yeah, time to get this outside, give it a very good clean and then reassemble it with some newer hardware and put this thing back into service. Okay, so now outside and it's absolutely pouring it down so this will be a very quick clip and also I'm going to use a little battery video light. But let's just give us a quick blast for the first time and see how much dust comes out on camera. So I'm just using one of these Amazon special battery operated air blaster things. I've got a mains one, but it's outside. It's a pain to try and get a cable to it. So I thought we'd just use, buy one of these. So let's try this out and see how much dust we get out of this. The answer, quite a lot. I don't think it's really showing up well on camera. Um, I'll need to try and review the video back and see. But yeah, there's a lot of dust coming out of this. So I'll go away off camera, keep cleaning this out and keep working at it and hopefully get it relatively clean and then we can start rebuilding it. Okay, so now back from cleaning it out. Hopefully it came across in that video. I don't know how well it actually showed the dust, but a lot of dust came out of this. It's not perfect. You can still see some sort of blackening on the fans there, but that dust kind of like baked on there, it would require quite a lot of scrubbing to take out. So to do that, we really need to dis disassemble the entire machine, and I don't really want to go to that level of having to disassemble this entire machine to clean it. But all the dust is actually blocking anything out, the heat sink's now completely clean, so it's not perfect, but it is a lot better. And equally, it's going back into that exact same environment where it got that dusty, so it's going to get dusty again, but it'll be fine. So, yep, that's all cleaned out. So what we'll now do is I've got a few new bits of hardware to put into this, so we'll take a look at those, and then we'll get this thing rebuilt. So now we have some new hardware to put in. So down the front here we have some hard drives. We have four four terabyte HGST Ultrastar drives. I had these in my old server. I made a video of that many years ago now. But since that server is no longer being used, these drives are kind of just sitting unused. So I've got them wiped and ready to go into here. It'll just give me a bit more storage. So I think I'll set these up as like a single RAID Z1. So that'll give me the usable, usable capacity of three of these drives, which should be absolutely plenty. Performance won't be great, but that's absolutely fine. They are 7200 RPM discs, so they're, they'll be pretty quick. I mean, they're a bit old now, but they'll be absolutely fine for what we're doing here. So yeah, four four terabyte hard drives will be going in. I'll be re reusing three of the existing caddies. I've bought an extra caddy because one of those was a blank that you can't put a drive in. So I've bought an extra caddy I'll be using to put these in. Next up, we have the RAM. We've got the two original eight gig sticks on the left. And on the right, we've got a pair of new, t new eight gig sticks, putting this up to 32 gigs. Again, I had this RAM spare in my old server, so I may as well use it. So. Yeah, well, I've got this up to 32 gigs of RAM. Won't really need it, but it's always good to have more RAM for ZFS. And if I do ever want to run a VM out here, I can. So yeah, 32 gigs of RAM will be going in. And then finally, for the boot drive, we have an interesting solution. So obviously, I could just boot this machine off of the hard drives. That would work. But I thought I may as well have this booting off of some sort of solid state storage. It means that Proxmox and the VMs can run off of SSD, and the hard drives can just be dedicated to storing my back offsite backups, which is maybe a bit neater. So of course this machine has no sort of SSD bays, it's only got four hard drives in the front, no two and a half inch bays internally or anything. So I'm going to be using this adapter here. And these things are quite neat. This is a StarTech adapter, I'll put a link in the description. 
and it allows you to adapt two SATA M.2 drives and a single NVMe drive into a single PCIe slot. So the way this works is if you've got an NVMe drive, you put that on the back there and it just connects it into the PCIe bus as you'd expect. But for SATA M.2 M SSDs, all it does is to connect them in there, it powers them from the bus, but actually to get the data from them, you plug SATA data connections into these cables here, into these ports here, and run the cables over to your motherboard SATA ports. So this is actually ideal, because you can get these sorts of cards that have built-in SATA controllers, but I don't really like using those, because those SATA controllers tend to be quite low quality, quite low end, and not very reliable. Whereas with this, I can mount a pair of SATA M.2 drives in the expansion slot out the way at the back, they're powered from the bus, so I don't need to try and get a SATA power cable over because that would be a complete pain. They're all kind of buried in there, and it'd be a real nightmare to try and get one over to here. So they're powered from the SATA, the PCIe bus, and then I can connect the data connections directly to these two spare SATA ports on the motherboard, which will run off of the good quality onboard controller. So that should be really good. Yeah, there'll be SATA drives, but it'll be absolutely fine. Realistically, this machine, I don't think it would really work well with, M with NVMe drives anyway, because I don't think it's UEFI and it definitely won't support all the kind of stuff for booting from a PCIe drive, so that was really out of the question, so I'm just going to use SATA M.2 drives. And as for the drives, we're using these 120 gig WD Green SATA M.2 SSDs. They are not good SSDs. I would not really recommend getting these, I think they're DRAM-less and everything, but again, I had these spare literally taking up space. I may as well stick them in. Like, I can't stress how non-essential this particular server is, so yeah, we'll just put these, these two old 120 gig WD Green drives in. So they'll go into that adapter there, and that'll go into the motherboard. Now, on this machine, there's two PCIe expansion slots. There's a full height one on this side here, and then a half height one over here. I th while this currently has a bracket for a full height slot, that means it would be sitting over here, but it would be upside down. So what I think I'll do is I'll swap this out for the half height bracket it came with, mount it in this half height slot here, keeping them, the drives over here, which means I can easily swap the drives out just by taking off the top of the server, and it puts them in the path of the fans, so the air airflow will come through here, through the CPU heatsink, and a little bit will go across those SSDs. Not that they really need it, but I may as well do that. So, yeah, time to get the new RAM, hard drives, and boot SSDs installed. And we're back. It's now the following day, because it turns out helpfully yesterday I forgot to pack one of the drive caddies, so I had to come, and come back today and bring that with me. But now we've got it all built. So as you can see down the front, we've now got all four hard drives installed. And you can just make on the front, maybe not, the lighting's a bit bad in here, but I've labelled each drive caddy with a drive serial number. So this makes it much easier when I'm swapping out drives in the future to identify what drive has potentially failed. So yeah, I've labelled all the drives up there. So yeah, that's, that's all the hard drives in there. Next up, you can see over here we have the new RAM installed, so that's all installed there. In the back, we can see we have the two M.2 SATA SSDs installed. Yes, the cable management's not great, that's going to upset people, but it'll be fine right now. Now, annoyingly, my plan of putting the SSDs face up here to make it easier to swap them hasn't quite worked out because the screws to replace them is under, are under this lip, so I can't actually get a screwdriver in to remove the SSDs without taking out that card and taking out the whole riser assembly. However, it's still nice keeping them there because it does mean that they're slightly in the path of the airflow, so it might help keep them cool. Not that these drives need it, but yeah, it should be quite nice in there, so yeah. Now, around the back of the machine, it's basically the same story. You can see we've got the card for the SSD is installed here with some LEDs on the back, so we'll see what these do when we turn on. And I also found a blank. It turns out this is actually the original blank from this machine that I took out years ago when this machine used to have a RAID card in it. But I found this lying around, so I put it back in just to kind of fill in that space. So, yep, that's all the hardware now finished. It's time to get this back in the rack, power it up and check it all works, and install Proxmox. So that's the server now installed back in the rack. Definitely looks a lot cleaner now I've taken it out and cleaned it all. You can all see the drive labelling a little bit clearer now. So now let's turn it on, so it's sitting in standby right now, so let's power that up. Then go over to monitor and see what happens. So it's posting anyway, so that's good. We can see it's detected the CPU. So I'll try and get in the BIOS and we'll see what it does, but there we go. Oh yep, so it's found the new RAM. It's doing some sort of memory check thing, but it seems to have seen all 8 gigs. Or, or all 32 gigs. Yep, 32 gigs RAM installed. So let's go into the BIOS and see what happens. So F9 is there. Let's jump in the BIOS and see what we have. Okay, so I've just quickly jumped into the RAID controller configuration, and as you can see, all the drives are now detected. Although, wait, why are those showing up as two terabyte drives? Because those are four terabyte drives. That's weird and slightly concerning. So I'm going to go and do a little bit of digging and work out what's happening here, because that doesn't make any sense. Hmm, interesting. 
okay, so panic over. I put it up into the Proxmox installer and it does seem to detect all the drives as 4 terabyte. So I think it's just the onboard RAID controller is really old and doesn't support larger drives, but it'll still pass them through to an OS. And that's fine because I'm going to use ZF ZFS on this. I'm not using the RAID controller. Okay, so I'm in the Proxmox installer. So we're setting up a ZFS RAID 1, so just a mirror for the boot drives. So it's like the two SSDs there. But if we go into here and we do select one of these hard drives, you can see the four or four terabyte hard drives are showing up and they're recognized as the correct size. So that was a slight panic, but yeah, everything's absolutely fine. So we can now go out here and continue installing Proxmox. Okay, so that's Proxmox now installing. As you can see, the LEDs on that SSD bracket are now blinking away, so they seem to light up green to indicate that an SSD is present and then blink red when there's activity. So yeah, that's installing. So I just need to wait for the install to finish and then get Proxmox set up. Okay, so we have Proxmox booted. So yeah, we can see we have all the drives detected. So we have the two SSDs detected and they're up, they're sitting in a mirrored Z pool, so that's working absolutely fine. And then the four or four terabyte drives are sitting there unused, so I'll create a Z pool from those and use that for storage. So I know, I'll now go away off camera and set all this up. That'll take quite a while. We'll take a quick look inside Proxmox after I've done just to see the configuration and then we'll wrap this up. But yep, yeah, that's all the drives detected. So we're good to go. Okay, so now it's all set up. Let's take a very quick look at my Proxmox setup. So here's the Proxmox web interface. If you look inside here, we can see we have two different storage areas set up. We have local ZFS, which is the, the SSDs as a ZFS mirror, and HDD ZFS, which is those four, four terabyte hard drives set up in a RAID Z1, which gives around about 12 terabytes of usable capacity, which is absolutely fine. That's way more than I need. So that's those both set up there. In terms of network, we have two different network interfaces set up. We have one interface, which is a physical interface connected into the network at the lab. And this is where I get my main uplink from. And we have this interface here that's a host-only network. So this is local to this host, and any VMs on that interface can talk to each other, but they can't talk out to the outside world directly. We then have a couple of VMs. The first one here is a router. This runs VIOS. And if we look at the configuration of this, we'll see it has two different network interfaces. So it has one network interface on the physical interface on the host, and another network interface on that host-only network. So this this VIOS VM has, has my public IP address assigned to it. It performs NAT. I can port forward through to VMs if I want to host public facing services if I want in the future. But the main thing it's doing currently is as a wire guard tunnel from here, back to my router at home, allowing me to connect directly to this machine from my home network without having to sort of set up any manual VPNs from individual clients. Anything on my local network can easily connect out to the server over that wire guard tunnel. So yep, that's running here and it's running VIOS. So we can go into console here. You can see that's there. So you may be wondering why I've gone for VIOS rather than PFSense, OpenSense, whatever other OS you want to name. Equally, I like them all and I really like VIOS, so that's the main reason I've gone for it. But the other reason I went with VIOS rather than something like PFSense is I wanted something command line based. Obviously, you can access VIOS through the standard console within Proxmox, which is a standard KVM console. It's essentially a direct video feed from the VM as if it was a monitor. But what's really good with VIOS being, being command line based is I can also access it from a serial console from the Proxmox host. So if we pull up an SSH session on the Proxmox host itself, we can run QM list, and this will list all the VMs that are running. We have 100 there, that's the only QMU virtual machine. And now if I run QM terminal 100, that will now connect me to a serial console on the VIOS VM. So I can now go into here, and there we're now inside the VIOS VM. So we can now log into that here, and now we're inside VIOS. So this is exactly what I wanted, because it means that I can easily access the router VM over SSH from the Proxmox host. Because if I was using something that required a web interface to manage the router, that could get a lot trickier if something went wrong. If I got Because I'm having to access the server remotely, if something went wrong that would stop me accessing the network properly, then I couldn't access the router to then access its web interface to then fix the network. It all gets a little bit messy. The good thing with VIOS is I can easily SSH into the bare Proxmox host from a sort of shell server that runs within the lab, then easily from there access the serial console on the VIOS VM and manage it. This machine also has out-of-band management, which, which gives me KVM access to the host, so I could easily go into the out-of-band management controller, access the Proxmox shell through that, and then access the VIOS VM from that. So it basically gives me much easier access to configure the, configure the router and fix any issues that go wrong. If it was a purely web interface based solution, it could get a little bit trickier if I had problems. So yeah, that's why I've gone with BIOS there. So we can just quit with that console and then move on. Equally, I can't actually remember the command to get out of the console. 
Ah, control O, of course. Of course, control O, that would be very clear. So yeah, that's the router VM, so that's performing that. It's got a wire guard tunnel back to my home network. And yeah, just basically, it has basic firewalling in that. So that's the router there. The only other thing we have here is this container called storage. So this is a Debian LXC container. Now the reason I have this is to allow my home network, my server on my home network, to upload backups to the ZFS pool on the Proxmox host without having to have direct access to log into the Proxmox host. So if we pull up a terminal on the Proxmox host, we can go ZFS list. And as you can see here, we have obviously the Proxmox stuff on the SSDs. We have the HDD pool and then a single file system on that, which is HDD slash storage which is on the hard drives. I want my home server to be able to upload its backups to this HDD slash storage mount point. But I don't want that server to be logging directly into the Proxmox host because that host is going to have a lot more stuff and a lot of VMs. I kind of want to limit that access. So what I have here is this LXC container. And if you look at the mount points on this, we can see we have obviously its own file systems. And I have then passed through the directory, which is this mount point here, slash hdd slash storage on the host, I have passed this through to this VM. So my home server can perform uploads to this over rsync, or I think I'll be using rclone. It can write to the, this mount point here, slash media slash host zfs, which will write directly into the Proxmox host zfs pool. But this VM can't access anything else on the Proxmox host. It can just access that single directory. So we can test this out if we cd to media host zfs. There's nothing in there currently. If we Go on to Proxmox host as well. We can check the same thing. So we see the slash media slash or slash HDD storage, which is the mount point here. LS there. Again, there's nothing. Oh, yeah, there's a folder called data. I'm actually uploading to that directory there. So nothing in there. If I go in here and then touch test file, that file's now there. We can check here. And as you can see, that file's now created. So we're sharing those files between the host and this LXC container here. So when I perform a backup from my home server, they'll write into this LXC container here. For backups, I'll be using rclone. The main reason for that is rclone can also encrypt the backups. So because the server is not in an insecure location, but it's not a completely secure location, someone could technically walk in, steal the server and walk off with it. Therefore, I don't want all my personal data to be stored on that completely unencrypted. So when I perform the backup to the server, I'll be using rclone so that the data is encrypted when it leaves my local machine and it's written to this machine completely encrypted. If someone stole this machine, there'd be no way for them to recover that data. But if I needed to get the data off this machine, I could easily get it. I'd have the encryption keys, I could decrypt the data. So that's why I've got this VM here and I'll be using rclone to back up to it. So yeah, that's Proxmox setup. Nothing that fancy at all. It's a pretty basic setup. I mean, it's only been I only set it up today. It's not really had that much time to set the whole thing up yet. But yep, yeah, that's all working. So there we go. That's my new offsite backup server, all working and running Proxmox. So there we go. That's the server all now installed and running. So, yep, definitely a little bit embarrassing sort of the state I let it get into, but equally you can't exactly predict a global pandemic stopping you accessing a server for a couple of years. But, yep, that's all cleaned up and working now, and it's working absolutely great as an offsite backup server. So, yeah, hopefully you found this interesting or entertaining or whatever people get from these videos. So yeah, that's my new offsite backup server. So I guess all that's left to say now is thank you very much for watching.